takes place on Dakina, or New Hampshire, and also a little bit in the Creek Reservation in Oklahoma. The New, New Hampshire is the traditional ancestral homelands and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook and Wabanaki peoples of the past and present. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnumbach, or human beings, who have stewarded Dakina throughout the generations. Welcome everybody, OCO. I'd like to start my role as moderator by asking you all uh, a series of questions. And the first question I would really like to ask is, who are the indigenous people of the region that we know today as Seacoast, New Hampshire? Uh, as a tribal group, uh, we get this question on a regular basis because of a continued colonial misconception that every indigenous location was occupied by a different or distinct tribal group. We are the Wabanakiek, or the ancient people of the Donlands. In our language, the root word is Waban. It's described as the place where the first white rays of the sun, or the aurora, as they sometimes call it, comes upon our lands in the Nakina, Turtle Island, or is now called North America. Within our own culture, we have always called ourselves Elmenbach, or human beings. So the question is always raised, what do you call yourselves today? and who lived here in New Hampshire. There's a good explanation for calling us the Waban Wabanaki, Abnaki, or Penacook, indigenous groups who are often named by other indigenous peoples or colonial contexts. In our case, the Lenape, the Delaware, call themselves the grandparents of the ancient Algonquin, but they called us the Wabanakiak, or their ancient ancestors that were here before them, or in other words, their paleo ancestors that were here from the time of the Ice Ages. This statement has been substantiated in the records of those first Jesuits in the Lenape that encountered us through their oral traditions. Unfortunately, in the late 1800s, the, the Smithsonian Bureau of Ethnology created taxonomies of indigenous peoples. Over 60 place name identifications were given for describing us as a people. These place names identities were used to uh, create a paradigm to divide us culturally and politically into smaller tribalistic factions. When we discuss place name constructs, we need to think about today. We live in states, counties, cities, towns, and neighborhoods. This was much the same for us in the past. We never, we lived in several locations and possibly as many as five annually. We moved around from villages of various sizes to seasonal food gathering camps for hunting, fishing, gardening, and other gathering. Governance of our communities was based on extended families and clans that held, were held together by strong matri matriarchal relations. So moving about within our peoples was as natural as visiting your own, your own relations. In summary, we, the Wabanakiek, have been here for thousands of years and continue to live here. We were never forced to relocate to other lands or reservations. We often moved within our homelands, which include a very large land mass that covered most of Northeastern United States and Canada, including much of Quebec, all of uh, New Hampshire, most of Western Maine, most of Vermont, and Northern portions of Massachusetts. However, since colonial contact and domination, we have been in a survival mode. We have preserved and persevered by assimilation and acculturation while continuing to maintain our traditional life ways and culture within an occupied 
homeland of Mandakinap, which is now called New Hampshire. Thank you, Paul. That, that uh, was very informative. I appreciate your remarks. Um, I want to ask, maybe I'll, I'll kick this question to Kathleen. Um, are, based on what Paul just shared with us, are there some prevailing stereotypes about local indigenous people from this region uh, of the Northeast that you could maybe share with us? Absolutely, Dan. Um, thinking about this, I think that the most interesting uh, thing that I've heard, and, and I'm going to share things that I've actually had people say to me individually, is that um, Native American people never lived in New Hampshire. The, the, uh, what it was said was that um, people lived in Vermont, they lived in, in Maine, and they walked back and forth against, uh, against New Hampshire, but never lived here, which is absolutely false. We've been here for over 12,000 years. Um, another thing that I've heard is that all the Indians have disappeared. They're all gone. They don't exist anymore. Yet here we are. Um, I've also heard that uh, some people consider indigenous mascots to be honoring of us. And the mascots really look like our, our Northeast Woodlands peoples. Um, and that is absolutely false. There is, is not any honoring in a Native American mascot. Um, I've also heard people say, it, you're nothing but a bunch of savages. There's a whole lot of history that, that needs to be shared and needs to be taught um, because that's obviously not the truth. Um, I've had people say, you people massacred my ancestors. And um, again, the real history of this land and what happened with the indigenous and the Europeans needs to be taught. Um, Denise, could you, could you share some more light on this question? Sure, Kathleen. All these stereotypes and misrepresented misrepresentations are in direct conflict with the recorded historical facts. The Jesuit missionaries were sent here to study the Abenaki, to record our language, traditions, belief system, culture, and ways. The purpose of this research was to discover how to manipulate our ancestors in order to convert them to Christianity. Father Eugene Vitramiel compiled and published many of those manuscripts and diaries. In those writings, the Abenaki were described as pious, righteous, and deeply spiritual. We are monotheistic, meaning we worshiped one God. We were fully clothed, not like the other regional tribes. We maintained a strong matriarchal society. We were multilingual, speaking French, English, Latin, among all the other indigenous languages we had already spoken, understood Christianity and debated and interpreted the Bible. And we maintained a consensus decision-making process. Father Vitramil asserted that their sentiments and principles of justice had no parallel among other tribes and that they were never known to have been treacherous nor wanting in honor or conscience in fulfilling their word or given even in public or in private treaty. While we may properly regard this as too great praise, we must admit that they possess the nobility of character remarkable in a savage people. It is certain that this that the missionaries found them more tractable and more ready to listen to their teachings than any other branch of the Algonquin family from which they came in contact. Although dignified and tacturn in council and among strangers, when free from restraint, they were social and always ready to join in amusements among themselves. Both men and women were uniformly described as being modest and perhaps the most remarkable thing to be recorded in favor of the Abenaki warrior is the fact that no female prisoner ever had any occasion to complain of him in any respect. Victor Mills records uh, the important fact that Abenakis and they alone of the Algonquin family possess the art of a wikigan, which is handwriting. Vichemil also gives examples which, were, which strikingly reminds one of the ancient phonetic script of Egypt and Phoenicia. He further states that the people were accustomed to send missives to one another written upon birch bark and the chiefs to dispatch written circulars of the same material to their warriors 
asking for advice. Indeed, the Abenaki asserted that their method of writing expressed ideas as fully and as freely as that employed by the Europeans. As this Jesuit record is clear, the manipulation that is called history being taught here in the United States has been focused on destroying indigenous communities in order to justify the theft of indigenous lands and resources. It is crucial that we decolonialize our educational system and begin telling the inclusive history of this nation if we are to ever truly become a nation of one people. In order to have a common future, we must have an inclusive past. <clears throat> Thank you for your remarks, uh, Denise and Kathleen both. I think you both presented kind of a nice snapshot of both some historical and, and current um, issues that uh, we can potentially talk a little bit more about. But Anne, I've got a question for you. Um, are there uh, some, you know, we've talked about traditional things and some historical things happening. Do you see some factors that uh, actually act to suppress or have it suppressed or continue to suppress indigenous ways of life in New England uh, broadly and New Hampshire more specifically? Uh, I do, thank you for asking. Um, I, I think at this point, it all, it, it all comes back to education and the need to educate people um, about the relationships, um, not only between amongst the Abenaki themselves, but since the colonial period, um, the ongoing pattern that has developed. Um, when the English first came to New Hampshire, uh, that was to settle the, coddle, um, the settlers and colonists, that was 1623. Um, in France, which is the northern edge of Abenaki territory, uh, New France, Canada, um, Quebec was settled in 1608. So very early on, the English settlers in Massachusetts Bay and in New Hampshire um, were needing of land and um, negotiating to acquire more land. Uh, up in New France, up in Canada, uh, the first settlers were coming in the 1600s, but that wasn't our first contact. The first contact happened here in the 1500s, the, the mid to late 1500s. So there's been a long, long history of interaction between the Abenaki peoples, first with the uh, European uh, colonists and settlers, explorers, colonists and settlers, and then later on the, the new United States continuing up through today. And what happened in, initially is that the Abenaki got caught in a pincher move between, uh, you know, in the, in the imperial struggles between England and France over who is going to control this part of um, what we think of now as the United States and southeastern Canada. Uh, and so there was about 50 years of peace and then war started because every generation of Europeans, uh, the new generation of sons needed more land for farming and moved in and, and were displacing the Abenaki peoples, causing tension between the people where they already were and the Abenaki people who needed to move into that space. So about 50 years in, a series of wars started that continued off and on between the English and the French and then between the English and the American colonists. So these wars were intermittent, but some of them very long, 10, 12 years long for a hundred years till the end of the American revolution. At that point, the relationship with the new United States uh, created all kinds of new tensions. The population of Americans was growing. There was a large percentage and growing population of, of unlanded, uneducated, uh, settlers, dis descendants of, I mean, you know, early col European colonist settlers, but also, um, you know, natural increase and also people still coming over from Europe. So it's always a push, pushing the indigenous people further and further north in our case and also west. Um, so then it got to the point where under Andrew Jackson's administration, the Indian Act of 1830 was written, which was to remove all indigenous peoples, all Native American peoples from east of the Mississippi River to west and particularly into Oklahoma. Um, so we're very familiar, I think, with the, with the situation of the five civilized tribes, civilized to put in quotes down south and the history of the Trail of Tears and the Cherokee, but um, it's dropped off, I think, the educational radar that this really impacted all of the indigenous peoples in the Northeast. And I've seen it in my own family and my husband's family, this phenomenon that 
Um, actually, a, a, a paper that I came across in the 1990s when I was in graduate school by Marge Bruchak, who now teaches Dr. Bruchak, is, I think, at the University of Pennsylvania teaching anthropology. But back then, it, it was a questioning about hiding in plain sight and um, how difficult it was for our Abenaki people today to establish their, their identity as Abenaki people because you got so good at hiding in plain sight. And that phenomenon meant um, Abenaki people moving further and further away of centers of uh, American population, you know, further away from the cities up into the Northern woods. Um, or if there had been intermarriage, if one happened to look more black or more white, it was better to be black or white than to be uh, Abenaki or of any Native American ancestry here in the Northeast. If, if people wanted to get in my own family, you know, my great grandfather's mother was Abenaki. I knew him, he was born in 1875. His mother was Abenaki. To me, that's touching, that's living history. Um, I knew him till I was about 10 years old. And he didn't speak uh, outside of the family of, you know, our native heritage, that part, that portion of our heritage. If you wanted to have a job, to have your children have an education, uh, to be in peace with your neighbors, then you kept your mouths quiet and you didn't tell the children so they wouldn't take it to school. So then one generation after another after another started growing up with that story about having had, uh, you know, Abenaki heritage, but not really under fully understanding their own history, just knowing that it was there, but it still wasn't safe. I started telling stories in public in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, when my daughters were born. And um, I actually went to my parents and asked them, is, is this going to be all right now if I go out, if I go into schools or what have you and, and acknowledge my Indigenous heritage because, you know, somebody's going to notice that at least one of you are also Indigenous. Is that all right? And it was, you know, it's, it, things unfold in their time. My mother is 93 now and she's so happy because I have spent 30 plus years learning more about the Abenaki people and everything that I find that I know reinforces what she heard, what she learned from her grandfather when back in the 1930s. So that brings um, up a good point. I, I love the, the comment you made about hiding in plain sight. And I really appreciate kind of the historical um, backdrop that you provide us about the Abenaki here in New Hampshire, New England. So that, that brings up another question. I, and then maybe I'll launch this one to, to James, if you don't mind answering this. It's about uh, some of the, the stereotypes and some of the misconceptions that people have uh, here in the Northeast. Um, do, do you think those types of stereotypes and, and misconceptions actually have an effect on the, the life of contemporary Abenaki people here in New Hampshire? Yeah, I do, uh, Dan uh, Sago. Um... They have a, a really um, direct and indirect uh, impact. Really, when you're talking about harmful stereotypes, it really comes in layers. And I'll speak from experience. My grandmother, when she used to tell me about the reservation, First Nations Reservation up in Canada, she would say, Jimmy, we were, ju we were, ju we were just Indians. And, and really what that means as a stereotype, you know, back in, you know, the 1920s and 30s and, and, and 40s and, and that, that period of, you know, when she was a young girl up there, a teenager, it's when you're just an Indian, you don't have these rights. And from that come certain stereotypes, like um, when we were driving in a car when I was young, a uh, police officer pulled over on my mother and asked her for her license. And, and you may know this as well. I don't know if they still do it today, but on my mother's license said it's American Indian on the license. So they used, they used to put it right on your license. And, you know, us young kids were in the car and the next thing you know, they're dragging my mom out of the car and, and beating her up. And um, another example is when I was in the sixth grade, I was leaving to go to the bathroom from my class and uh, there was a group of teachers in the hall and I was walking by and they're like, oh, there's Jimmy Edgel. He's not going to make it like the rest of them. They're Indians. And for me, that had a real strong impact 
um, and I went into the seventh grade actually um, failing for half the year, except for gym. <laughs> um, and it was some great teachers there in junior high and high school that really um, looked beyond that and really took an interest and really helped me. But that, that, that was, uh, you know, as a, as a kid in, in the sixth grade, that was really tough to hear. And the just the Indian um, stereotypes kind of trans, uh, transfers over um, to really, what are you doing here? So the big kids used to wait on a corner in the first grade when I went to school and they used to call me, my the nickname for me was Bald Eagle F and Indian. And they used to yell at me when they were chasing me, um, go back, go back to where you belong. And I couldn't really understand that. I was like back to where I belong. It, it really confused me. I didn't understand why they were saying that. And a, a group of kids came up to me uh, when I was a little bit older and said, you know, you're Mohawks, what are you doing here? And then another kid said, oh, they're related to the chicks, a Wabanaki family in Newmarket. And then he goes, oh, oh, I get it now. It's an Indian thing. And then um, at work, a uh, gentleman uh, about four years ago was talking to another uh, gentleman I know that works for that department. Was there were group was talking about me and they were wondering, um, the guy said, well, what's he doing here? And the gentleman I know who was my former Kung Fu instructor, who's African-American as well as indigenous, asked him what he meant. And he goes, well, what's he doing here? And he goes, well, what do you mean? And they really had a good dialogue. And then he came back the following Monday and really, you know, going to Ann's thing about education, he went home and talked to his wife and said, you know what, my, what I, my, my train of thinking was wrong. You know, that was targeting and discrimination and he apologized. In the Marines, you know, when you're talking about stereotypes with tribes and tribes up in Bangor, when I joined the Marines, um, I told them I was Mohawk. Well, the next time I went in, the gunny sat me down and he said, you know, we also know that you're Micmac, Mi'kmaq, or whatever you call yourselves. And I was like, well, I never told you that. And he's like, well, the government has everything. They have your tribal right records. They got everything on you. And he goes, just so you know, we're going to call you Mohawk. Because let's face it, if somebody yells Mohawk, it instills fear. But if they yell Mi'kmaq, eh. So a friend of mine was saying, well, good for the Mohawk, but you know, not so much for the Mi'kmaq, which is a very proud nation with a warrior society. So there's really layers when you go down. And then you got the Hollywood stereotype. So I had a faculty member come up to me a little over two years ago in front of a director, a manager, and a work study in another. And he's going whoa, 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 to me at work. And two of the people walked away. And I'm looking at him like, I'm not saying anything and looking at him. And then the director said, do noted, inappropriate. And then he did it again. And then the director said to him again, do noted, inappropriate. Well, this person kept carrying on making comments to me. And then it kind of got to a point and we were setting up for an event over at Huddleston Hall uh, with, with the work study student that he made comments in front of before with me. And we set them all up with all the technology and AV equipment. And then he comes up to me at the end and he's like, hey, sorry, I didn't bring you some scalps today. And at that point, um, management asked me to write a letter. So I wrote a letter to management and um, I ran into a provider over at Health and Wellness who wanted to talk to me because she said that her neighbor came up who she thought was the nicest guy who's a tendered faculty and made nasty comments about indigenous peoples, how that changed her perspective. And of course, it was the same person. And the interesting thing is I've spoken, guests spoke at that uh, school. I was, last time I was over there, he came up to me and said, hi, how you doing? I just want to let you know what, what you do for your people is, is great. So did, did he kind of get educated and see the light? It's, it's, it may be, but really when you look at, I, I, a lot of his motives seemed to me that they were really driven by Hollywood stereotypes. So and that kind like of- a, It sounds like we have a, a bit of work to do as far as misperceptions and, and stereotypes in terms of indigenous people in New Hampshire. Ab absolutely, Dan. And one thing is humor. 
So I have a lot of people that we have a big family and we have family events. So people have come to our family events that are not native and they're like, we love to come to your family events because you people are so funny. But and they'll comment, we never would have thought that. So you're right on, Dan. That's interesting. Well, I appreciate the, the background information that, uh, that all of you have shared.